so if you import that FMC features CSV file, uh, it's normal data. It's not a batch data set in this case. It's a, just a normal data set that we're going to do PC and PLS on. Um, the second column there, the disposition, should be a secondary variable. So please flag that as a secondary variable. You're going to use that to color code your plots by it. The same way that we looked at when we were looking at classification. So color code, uh, set disposition, the outcome, in other words, of the batch is a, is a secondary variable. X matrix. And then just remember to go back to your X block and exclude all those Zs. We're not using them in this particular analysis. So your X, your X block should just consist of um, those feature variables. So there's 13 feature variables that, that are pre-extracted and pre-calculated for you. Your Y block consists just of the five, uh, the eight Y variables, Y1 up to 11 and so on. components you should get a score plot that looks roughly like that. Um, it's color coded to emphasize that, that disposition. So what we have here then in black are the batches that are on spec and in green are the batches that are off spec. In this particular color coding, green is off spec, and black is on spec. The red batches are batches that are marked in the disposition column as having high solvent. These were batches that weren't bad. They just they were they were considered on specification other than for the fact that they had a high amount of solvent left over in the product. Okay, so not necessarily bad batches, but it's it's good to see that they cluster in the in the region of good batches. So the red dots fall in, in, in with the on spec. Green is definitely off spec. So, in other words, what are the characteristics of an off specification batch? What do the trajectories of an off specification batch look like? Like a large level mean three. Sorry, does a large level mean? Level uh, B in phase three is high. So uh, we'll just do a contribution plot between the black points roughly and quick way to actually verify that is one problem with the contribution plot. It depends on the order that you, you select the first group versus the second group. If you're not sure which way around it is, just highlight one of them with a large bar and look at the raw data. Okay? And then in blue there, it highlights for us. So uh, these were the, these first batches are the on-spec batches, and then these last ones are the off-spec batches. So off-spec batches have high level of mean three. They also have, uh, let's just finish up with the negatives, they also have high differential pressure in the first place. Uh, which are, what else? How else would you characterize them? Yeah? 
Increases during the phase, but the rate at which that's doing it, the slope, is uh, low. So in other words, it's not as it's not as rapid an input uh, of torque into the, into the system. So low torque input, slope in phase one. Other things would be a low uh, mean temperature of the set point in phase three. spec batches over here and all spec batches have a lower slope and temperature in space two. Okay, so here I'm, here I'm verifying the features in, in, in my raw data set. What I'm going to show you now is I've, I've highlighted in, in a different software package that uh, I've actually created the, oh, I've plotted out the trajectories as they, as they originally appeared and I've highlighted two lines. One is a bad batch, one is a good batch. Okay. And so we should see that here visually in the data, in, in the raw data itself. Let's, uh, let's take a, uh, one here as level mean three. So we set a high level mean three corresponds to no specification batch. That's that batch. I, I, unfortunately, I, I wanted to color code these two lines, but I couldn't, uh, couldn't do that. So this is my old spec batch and there's my on spec batch. So that gives you a visual indication of how different that is. So when, one thing is to say that yes, all spec batches have high level in the third phase, high average level in the third phase, but how high is high? And how different is it really from the on spec versus off spec? So this graph is a great way to, to describe it. And actually, would be a great way to show the operators. This is what we would like to see for good batches, is that they're level and that third phase is low. Okay, but how do you get a low tank level in the third phase? You have to work backwards, right? So that tank level in the third phase isn't changing. Notice that it's a function of how fast you ramped up actually in the first phase. Because how fast you ramp up in the first phase is how, where it remains for phase two and phase three. So to say that you want a low level the tank in the third phase means that the slope in the first phase needs to be low. Again, that may not necessarily tell the operators exactly how to implement that in practice, but that, that will likely come from one of these other variables, will result in a low uh, tank level in that, in that third phase, or in the first and second phase as well. High differential pressure corresponds to bad batches. Now this plot is, is actually quite interesting. Notice there's a, a couple of lines over here. The vast majority of the line are just here at zero. Okay, so most of the good batches had just a flat line over here. Those a low differential pressure in phase one would be a good batch. High differential pressure in phase two is just that small increase over there that takes it up. So something has caused a problem in the system that off spec batches have this offset. I'm not sure exactly what it is that's causing that, but it propagates then throughout phase one and phase two. Uh, low torque slope, okay, so here's, uh, here's torque and then the slope of that. We're wanting a lower torque slope corresponds to a bad batch, a higher torque slope corresponds to a good batch. So again, very little there's a lot of noise here as well, so it makes it really hard. But basically, good batches are, the, are at the higher end, bad batches are at the lower end, and how that slope goes over time. 
then some of the other trajectories are over here. Uh, we had the temperature set point. Uh, was that D temperature set point or J temperature set point? slope temperature was also so let's just go back to the raw trajectories D temperature set point <coughs> in phase 3 bad batches have this profile, good batches stay up, ok so that's there's a very strong indicator there, the bad batches for some reason in that third phase they drop off down here, yeah, that differential uh, at a D temperature set point. I'm not sure what D temperature means. But uh, for the good batches, they, they tend to stay higher. But, and that, that's a set point. That's something that's implemented in the control system of the batch. That's likely something we can change to get batches behaving more consistently. And then the final one that we picked up was low slope temperature D uh, corresponds to bad batches. So that's in phase two. So this is a very, very subtle uh, difference here. Bad batches have a lower slope or a less steep slope. So those would be actually the batches at the top, they have a less steeper slope. The steeper slope are the batches here at the bottom end. Those are the better, better batches. So again, not sure if that's something we can actually implement and change in the future, but it certainly is a characteristic of a good batch versus a bad batch. So just to, just to reiterate then what we've said here, feature extraction is a powerful way of getting very similar results from batch data analysis. We're going to, when we do batch data analysis in the class today, we're going to use these plots and we're going to do PCA on all the batch data, the full set of trajectories. In other words, when we look at our data cube later on today, we're going to use all the data in this <coughs> in this uh, matrix X over here. But feature extraction is a human way to try and reduce that large quantity of data down to a smaller matrix. Okay, so we reduce it down to the smaller matrix X, which may or may not capture all the variation in that original block, in that original cube. Um, so there's a few other disadvantages as well. So, uh, the other disadvantages are that when you've got smoothly changing trajectories, it's really hard to extract features from them. Okay, so in this, in this particular case, the mean certainly isn't useful for that particular day, tag. Uh, you could calculate, the, uh, the mean would, be, would be not be useful, but you could calculate at some slope. But then again, the slope over that whole region is just going to be some average line. You probably want to calculate the slope in this first <coughs> phase and then in the latter phase, because the slope is changing over time. Um, some of these other data points here that, uh, sorry, other tags that have these kinks in them or these particular changes over time, again, really hard to quantify two or three features that might be useful that capture that variation. Okay. You'll see in today's class we don't need to do that if we do the full batch data analysis. Um, the other thing is sometimes there's very subtle defects and changes within a batch. So we'll see this case study later on where this little bend in the, in the that's highlighted here in red was the cause of a, of, a, of a very particular problem. But if you calculated the features, you likely would have missed that. The features you might have calculated would have been a mean. And it may not necessarily capture that change in that trajectory. Sure, maybe the mean for the rate curve would be slightly lower because of that bend, but it might not be enough to capture that that particular problem. Okay, so feature extraction is really hard to quantify everything about your data set, but it's a really quick and easy way to get started. Furthermore, many of the packages out there don't do batch data analysis. The ProCensus software is about the only one I know of. The metrics, uh, Syncope does it, but it does it badly, and we'll talk about why it does it badly later on. Uh, so really, if you want to do batch data analysis and you don't have the software to do it, you can 
if you do the feature process first and then follow it up with an ordinary PLS or ordinary PCA after that. extract those features into this matrix here. This, ma this is an ordinary 2D matrix where every row contains the features just for that batch. Okay, so it's not, it's not a 3D data. So we don't have time to do this. There's no, yeah, you, you try to catch and summarize that 3D data cube, you've converted this 3D data cube down to a 2D matrix. What we're going to look at next is how do we deal with a 3D data cube completely with, PL, with PCA. So the assumption is our data are pre-aligned and we can form this 3D data cube. But the reason why I'm not covering how we align the data just yet is I first want you to see what we actually can achieve with this data set. Because once you understand what we're going to do with this 3D data cube, you'll understand why we need to align it and how to align it. So the assumption is that we've got a very carefully arranged data set, one, a group of rows for batch one, a group of rows for batch two. When you import this into the software, the software actually recreates this internally. Outside, you'll probably import your data in this format. And so in the case studies we look at today, you'll import the data as one 2D matrix but really, it represents a 3D data cube. And once you have that 3D data cube, you can slice it in three particular ways. You can slice it vertically, so top to bottom. Slice it like a loaf of bread going front to back. You can slice it horizontally, um, which horizontally is this way. And you can slice it, sorry, vertically was this way. I mean, kind of go slice it left, left to right. Horizontally, top to bottom, and depth-wise, you slice it like a loaf of bread, basically going front to back. Okay. So three, three ways that you can slice it. And then once you have those slices, you can stack them either side by side or top to bottom. So I've illustrated those six combinations here in this, in this image. Now, notice that this first unfolding really just corresponds to the way that you, the data are set up. So initially, when you've got your data in Excel or some CSV file, you have them unfolded already with, with J rows for each batch, corresponding to the J time steps. And then you've got N of these batches. So you've got N J rows with K columns, which consist of that, that first unfolding. If I slice the batches uh, according to this n dimension, and I've got uh, I've got k of them, I get k n rows. Or similarly, I can just get n k rows. But both cases here, case two and three, have j columns. Okay, so I've sliced them going from left to right, and just depending on how I stack them up, I can get slightly different row ordering. But PCA and PLS, remember the key thing with PCA and PLS is it's insensitive to the order of the rows. Okay. If I take a data matrix X and I import it into the software and build a model, and I compare it to another situation where I've randomly shuffled my rows around, I'll get the identical model in both cases. Okay. So PCA is not going to change if I reorder my rows. So from that point of view, if I import my data uh, sorry, if I unfold my data in this way, so I get k times n, or k blocks each of n, n pi, or if I unfold it n pi, but I have k of them, both of those two models will give me the same uh, set of loadings and scores and so on. So from that point of view, two and three are redundant. Unfolding four is the folding that we're going to be most interested in today. And five, in fact, is the same. Four and five are also identical. They both have in common the fact that we have n rows, one row per batch. So that's the critical point. But the difference between four and five is either I can go group my columns for all my variables, one, two, three, up to capital K, 
these correspond to all my variables at time step one. All my variables at time step two, three, up until my final time step. This particular ordering is, is similar. I only, the only difference is I take all my time steps, uh, one, two, three, let's say up to 100 time steps, for, and then I go to my second time steps and up to my final time steps. Okay? But I have k of them. So I have all the time-based data for variable one, all the time-based data for variable two, and then all the data, time-based data for my final variable. So four and five, again from the perspective of PCA, are identical because PCA doesn't depend on how you order your columns. And then the final unfolding is shown here is six. Okay, so six potential combinations, four of them are, are unique from the perspective of PCA. Yes. We'll come back to this important topic later on, but really your choice of how you unfold the data and then build your model depends on what you want to get from that model. And it also depends strongly on what pre-processing you'll do. Because we're going to center and scale those data before we build a PCA model. So I'll look at, um, after the in the next break, um, after the next break, we'll actually look at what centering and scaling does in the case where I've unfolded this way in, in form one, or called observation-wise unfolding. And I'll look at what centering and scaling does in the case of four and five, or batch-wise and four, you've got one batch per row. Okay, so there's a subtle difference of what pre-processing does in those two instances. Well, actually, it's not a subtle difference. It's a huge difference what it does. Okay, <laughs> so um, we'll look at that. And then we'll also, how you choose to unfold is really going to into, uh, affect what you interpret. If we unfold using um, method four or five, where you've got one batch per row, then when we look at our score plot, we're going to get one score for every row, one score value for every row. And so our clusters in our score plot tell us how the batches are related to each other, which batches are good, which batches are bad, should cluster together. Um, also, our columns cluster in the loading plot. So columns with similar weights, they will tell us how the, the tags change over time. So we'll come back to those two points um, Next. Okay, so here's the key, the key uh, thing you need to understand. When we're going to look at the data in today's class, we're going to take our 3D cube, or our multi-way data set, as it's sometimes called. We're going to slice, going from front to back, and we're going to place those slices side by side and form an unfolded X matrix. So that we've got one batch per row. And in other words, this row is extremely long. It's many, many thousands of columns long in most batches because we're going to have all the data from time step one. Let's, let's take the case where um, we've got a thousand, sorry, let's take a hundred time steps, so a hundred minute duration batch. And let's say we've got 10 columns. So this will co consist of my 10 columns at time one, 10 columns at time two, all the way up to 10 columns at time 100. So there's a thousand columns there, 10, 10 by 100. We're going to calculate a loadings matrix that's also the same number of columns long, and maybe two or three components. So the height of that P matrix is only two or three rows because of the number of components we count. And then T will have one row for every batch. So we'll get a set of scores for every batch, T1, T2, T3, one set of scores for every batch. Okay, and I'm not going to elaborate on the theory anymore. I'm going to introduce this concept purely by an example. And there's one very unfortunate thing I discovered. In the software for the course, I didn't realize the academic version um, does not, they take away the functionality of the batch data analysis. Okay, so, the irony is the trial version, the 30-day trial version, you can do batch data analysis with, but once you activate the academic version, it takes away your capability of doing batch data analysis. So what I've done in the notes is I've got my own batch software that I've written years and years ago in MATLAB, but it's very beautiful, and that's the figures that I've illustrated in the notes for you are from my own personal code. 
so that you actually have notes to follow along with and see what, what to do. I will, I've uninstalled the software on my laptop and gone back to the 30 day trial and I will use that to demonstrate to you in the class, but I, I can't expect you to follow along. Okay? So for those of you that are doing batch projects using the software, you may have to find a second computer or uninstall the software and do the batch data analysis on that computer. Um, and you've got 30 days before the end of the course, so I'm going to be crazy on that. But I, I apologize for that, I didn't realize there was that restriction. Okay. So, I will demonstrate in the software, in the actual course software, what it looks like, but in the notes, the figures that, I, that you have in the notes won't look identical to those as I go through the software, but they are, uh, they do match. Okay. So the first data set we're going to deal with is the following one. Uh, Paul Nomikos uh, did his thesis on batch data analysis and was the first to, to, uh, to, to show how to apply latent variable methods to batch data in the mid-1990s. So we're going to use, uh, in fact, two, two of the case studies from his thesis in the class today. And Paul uh, went on to go work for DuPont, uh, which is where he got the data from originally that he used in his thesis. So this comes from 35 batches produced on a nylon reactor. And we have available to us uh, several tags. We've got 10 batch variables. We've got temperatures, pressures, and flow rates. Okay, so here I've illustrated what they look like. We've got temperature in the reactor one, temperature in the reactor two, and a third temperature in the reactor. Now, unfortunately, these data have been scaled with dimensionality, so the units on the y-axis don't match up with what you would expect temperatures to, to be. We have a pressure in the reactor, a flow rate one, and a flow rate two of reagents to the reactor. So as the batch progresses, we do add some reagents to, to the process as, it, as it's going. Obviously here we see that whatever this reagent is, the second flow rate for uh, is turned off from time point 60 onwards. So that goes to zero, but this first reagent is continually dosed to the reactor. Uh, we have a temperature of the heating system, so it's roughly constant initially, and then that heating system is, is, is on to cool down. The temperature for the coolant, the second pressure in the reactor, the third pressure in the reactor. So those are the trajectory profiles. One thing you notice about them is how well controlled they are. They're really close to each other. Like these three temperatures almost just look like one solid line, but there's 55 batches there. So DuPont here is able to very consistently track and, and get this trajectory profile. Okay, so whether that trajectory profile is pre-specified and the control loop works to obtain it, or if it just happens to come by naturally from the way they run the reactor, I suspect it's the former, that they actually want to run along a particular profile. They do it very, very well and very repeatedly for these 55 batches. Now, you can see a few little unusual events taking place over here. So the, here the majority of the data uh, go together and they Kind of set, they start out at different points initially and they land up together and then split out again afterwards. Uh, here, pressure two and three. Here, we see the majority of the data slope down really low, and, but a few of the batches uh, go out there. So, from that point of view, those batches are, are likely going to be our outliers. Okay. We'll confirm that if that is in a minute. The other thing that was really uh, nice about this data set was that Paul didn't have to align it. Okay. They, what he did do was he did a little bit of trimming. I'll talk about that at the end. But basically the data came pretty much aligned with 100 time intervals per batch. And that corresponds to a two hour duration. Now, one thing that's interesting about this data set is that once the batch is over, these two hours are over, they take a sample sent to the lab, but they have to wait 12 hours before they get an analysis back. That's a huge hold up time for a two hour batch to wait for 12 hours before you can decide to discharge it to the next step in the process is, is a huge, huge holdup in a company that's producing many, many of these batches per year. So one thing to hold in the back of your head is, how can we build a system so that we can look at all this data coming from the, from the batch and decide as soon as the batch is over whether it's okay to release it to the next step. Okay, so 
can we multivariately decide that everything ran consistently as we expected and then release it to the next step? So a crude way that some companies do that, and this is actually quite bad, but it, it, it works adequately, but it's, it's not very elegant, is they'll take good batches and they'll construct like a two sigma profile to the top and the bottom of every, every one of their tags. And as long as the batch moved within that two sigma profile, they'll release it at the end saying it's okay. But this is, again, you're, you're doing things univariately, right? And you can expect, like we saw earlier in the process monitoring section, that univariately you can be in control, but multivariately you'll be out of control. You can get exactly that, that case happening. So there's a more elegant way of doing multivariate monitoring that we'll look at um, in probably the next class, which we probably want to touch on today. Okay, so in the software, if you, if you, if you, <laughs> if you did have it and you were following along, you would get a score plot that looks something like this. Okay. I'll just show you what it looks like actually here. And I did upload the CSV, excuse me, the CSV file to the website. So if you do happen to uninstall the software or have a second computer available to run the 30 day trial, uh, you can replicate these results. So you go to dupont.csv and open that. And you would say that this is batch data this time rather than normal data. Now initially it doesn't show you anything different here. This is actually the same input screen than, than before. And it actually allows you to see what the CSV file looks like. There's 5,500 rows, 55 batches of 100 time samples get you your 5,500 rows. And there's 10 columns, or our 10 variables that I showed you the trajectories for earlier. This first column batch ID is should be set as your primary variable. So it doesn't pick that up automatically, so you have to force it in. And that just that is exactly that indicator I spoke about earlier. It's 111s, 222s, 333s, up to the final set of rows 55 corresponding to the 55th batch. So it's going to use that information to refold <coughs> internally in its memory. It will refold the data into that 3D cube because it knows now where to make those divisions. Say OK. And now you can preview the data, and there's a nice little feature here where you can display the mean trajectory. So it's gone and calculated the average trajectory of, of, of the 55 batches, and it's highlighting in blue then the temperature in reactor, uh, the first temperature in the reactor for batch one. And as I scroll down, it shows me for batch two, three, four, five, and so on. Okay, so notice how the blue and the black lines match quite closely because that trajectory is followed very well by, by all the batches. You can go look at, at each of the tags for every one of the batches. So here's a particular batch, 51, where the average trajectory in black and the actual batch trajectory in blue for batch 51 is very different to the mean, and certainly at, in the beginning and a little bit here at the end of the batch. Um, some of the other batches are much more close. So here the blue line is near the top. So batch 49 is near the top, batch 50, 51, 52, 3, and 4. These batches have very atypical behavior, at least for this single variable. And so that's likely going to be outlying observations. So sometimes you're lucky enough to see that in the raw data, not always. Okay. So this is a nice tool to preview the data. So okay, save that. And there's our 10 variables, there's our 55 observations. And we go ahead and say OK. And if I just put two variables, we get our R squared. So now this R squared is nothing more than, let's just come back here. <coughs> If I unfold this matrix, so internally the software has unfolded that, and it's calculated R squared in the usual way. It's calculated R squared as if these were a thousand columns over here. And just so that R squared that's reported to you is nothing more than the overall R squared for the entire batch data set. Okay, so it's not a, you don't have to interpret it any differently. Um, 
it's simply telling us that the first component can explain roughly 40% of the variation over all the batches. The second component adds an additional 3% to take you up to about 55, 58%, whatever you want to go. T1, T2, the your plot uh, will be switched around um, because they come from two different packages. But shows exactly what we expected there. And we saw that in the raw data that some of those batches at the end had very different behavior. Batches 50, 51, up to 55. Very different behavior. And what we can go do now is build a contribution plot to figure out why. So let's take a look then at batch 54. And asking for the contribution will show me why 54 is different from all the others. Now, just one thing to come back to. Remember, ordinary PCA on an X matrix will give you one contribution value for every column in the X matrix. What contributions do for batch data are exactly the same, but the only difference is it's more useful to go group those by variable. So here's all the contributions for the first variable from time step one up to 100 all the contributions for the second variable from time step 1 up to 100. So we've got 10 of these divisions, one for each of the 10 variables. And there's 100 little bar plots for every, uh, within each of the, each of the tags. Okay. So, let's see. Um, Before I go ahead and interpret that, I, I, just, I actually want to follow the ordering of those just because uh, it uh, matches with what you've got. So I, I jumped a little bit ahead here by going to the contributions. Let me just back up a bit and go uh, to the square prediction error. I noticed in the notes I did, I showed the score plot and then the square prediction error. Let's go do that over here. Um, square prediction error. You should have a similar plot in your notes showing that We'll get one SPE value for every row in the batch. So we have 55 batches, 55 SPEs. Batch 49 is well above the 99% limit. There's, and we expect for 55 batches, we expect about one batch, but this one is so high that it's definitely, um, definitely very unusual compared to the rest of the batch. So let's go investigate that one. And what I did in the, in, the, in the notes for you was to show you the raw data for batch 49. Now, the reason why I did it this way is batch 49 was identified as having bad quality of the final product. So one thing to, to go look at, I'm, I'm taking a look at this from the company's perspective before they had implemented this technology here. Uh, if the company had gone and detected that batch 49 had bad, bad quality as measured by the lab, the first thing that they would go do is to go back to the raw data to see how the batch was operated. And one thing you can do is to overlay the bad batch shown here in red on top of good previous batches. So that's exactly what I've gone and done here is, is shown how batch 49 looks similar to previous good batches. Now notice here how very consistent the 49 is with the previous data. It's very hard to find fault with pretty much any of those variables over there, any of those tags. The only thing that we notice maybe that's slightly different is that here in this region, the flow rate normally goes up, dives down, and then comes back up again. But batch 49 just seems to keep going up and up and up. Yeah. To uh, like all the components, so we have like 11 components, and 49 actually becomes like this SPU, like approximately zero. Yeah, because as you're adding more and more components, you're explaining all the variations, so everything comes closer to the model plane. Yeah, yeah, but that's, uh, and in that case, you fitted the maximum number of components, so everything, I think, goes down to zero. Yeah, but yeah, that's an interesting, <laughs> interesting thing. Right? Uh, with two components, though, I, I I didn't do auto fit, but with two components. 49 seconds up, but I don't know when it becomes comes back in. Yeah, the uh, just interesting because it's going from like the highest to the low to the to low, low, low. Yeah, okay. So let's just come back here. But if, if batch 49 was identified as bad, it's very likely that this flow rate might be 
identified as the cause of the problem. If you look closely though, you do notice that all these three, uh, all these four variables, the temperature, the heating, cooling, and pressure two and pressure three, they show that that temperature profile bypasses the normal duration. So the normal duration is that it goes for a little bit longer and then it comes down more sharply. Temperature here for batch 49 seems to come down a little earlier, kind of taking a little shortcut over there. C1 shows the same pressure 2 and pressure 3. And I, because of the limited information here from the company, I can't confirm this, but whenever I look at all these plots, I always notice temperature H1 and pressure 2 and temperature C1 and pressure 3 kind of go hand in hand. So I get a feeling that they're related there in some way. Um, but all four of these trajectories show that same particular problem. So one thing to go do is, given that this is an ordinary PCA, is just to go do a contribution plot for batch 49. Do an SPE contribution plot. And SPE contribution plots, remember, will give you one contribution for every column. Okay. And that's exactly what's shown here. We'll get, for every column in that data set, we'll get a, a, a bar plot here. So there's a thousand bars here, 10 variables are the 100 time steps. And I group them up by first, second, third, up till the 10th variable. And what you see when you visualize the data this way is that it immediately picks up these one, two, three, four variables and this flow rate variable as well, okay, as showing the contributions. Not only does it tell you which variables have the contribution, but it also tells you when. Okay? So this comes back to the important thing I wanted to emphasize about that process. It's not just the changing correlation structure amongst the variables, it's when did that change occur that we can find out. That's critical about batch data. We're not just identifying which are the problem variables, but also when those problems occur. Now when we go back to the raw data uh, in the previous slide, we can pick out those time periods over there and they show up very clearly and then here in flow two, I didn't notice that earlier when I was pointing this out, but now you can see it actually. That red line crosses over. It's, it's a less steep slope than the top than the, than the remaining batches which tend to drop off much more rapidly. So this flow rate wasn't turned off quite fast enough. Not certainly as fast as the other batches. So it had a more gradual drop off down to zero and in fact was was likely the cause of that particular problem in batch But is what I want to check with you, this is clear about the contribution plots, right? Any, any variable from PCA, any sort of loading plot, contribution plot that, that, that goes along this long axis over here can be unfolded back into a, a useful display either by time or by variable. And in this particular case, for, S, for the contribution plot, I wrapped it up and group the contributions for variables. And within each variable, I'm showing you the evolution of that contribution plot over time. That's the, that's the key understanding here. You can also do something quite interesting uh, and group it by time. Okay, so here, in this previous, uh, I've showed 1,000 columns grouped by time, I've grouped by variable rather, but here, what I've gone and done is I'm showing only 100 columns, and I've summed up the contribution values for the variables. So at time step one, I've got 10 variables, and I can sum up their, their 10 contributions and create a single new bar for those sum of 10 variables. At the second time point, I sum up another 10 values and plot its bar, and I keep going. The moment then when you get to this, when this problem occurred, you start to get very large bars because you're summing much, much larger numbers. So this is a helpful plot because it's showing you the overall contributions to SPE on a time basis and indicates very clearly when that problem occurred. <coughs> Another way that I can sum is instead of summing up by time by 10 variables, I can go sum up by variables by time. So you have a summing time by variables here I'm summing variables by time. So for variable one, over all the 100 time steps, I go sum up those contributions and plot a single bar. Two, 
two, three, four, up to my tenth variable. So this indicates to me what you would probably consider a more usual contribution plot that you're comfortable with from PCA in the past, where you get one contribution value per variable. So here's one contribution value per tag, and it highlights for me quite clearly which are the, the major players in this particular contribution. So six, seven, eight, nine, ten show up quite strongly in one. Variable one, tag one, shows up to a best extent. So three different ways of looking at any of the any of the variables that show up on that long axis can be shown in three different ways. Either you look at the raw data as shown here, but just with, with vertical lines to guide your eye, or you can sum it by time, or you can sum it by tag. Now, the software, uh, the core software that we use, unfortunately, doesn't do this for you. Okay? you. You'd have to go do this manually outside. You'd have to go copy and paste those thousand contributions and, and calculate those summations yourself. Uh, any questions on that? Yeah. Um, you, before, when we were determining outliers, you used to say that it has to be outside the SPE and the Italian T squared. Right? And or. And or? Yeah. Okay, because when we did, when I did the hoteling uh, and the SPE versus each other, it, 49 wasn't in the in the outside area. It was actually just had a high SPE. Yeah, so in this case, you're absolutely right. 49, uh, let's take a look here. Uh, if I go back to the score plot that I had up here. Batch 49 is somewhere inside this cluster over here but it's high off the plane. Yeah. Okay. Hotelling's T squared, because I've only fit two components to this PCA model, Hotelling's T squared corresponds exactly to that elliptical boundary. So yes, Hotelling's T squared is normally plotted as a horizontal bound, but for two variables, that bound corresponds exactly to this ellipse. So 49 is somewhere inside this cluster, but it's far away from the model plane, either off the board or behind it. So how would we have known from before, other than knowing from like the, let's say the company told us from beforehand that this is a bad batch, but oh, okay. how would we have discovered that? Right, uh, here the SPE plot shows batch 49. So just, so from SPE's perspective, this is an outlier. So there's two types of outliers. Outliers that are off the model plane, which is SPE, and outliers on the model plane but far away, those are shown up by hotel T squared or outliers that have both aspects to them. So in this case, batch 49 is an outlier off the model plane. Batches 50 and upwards are outliers on the hotel, from hotel's T-squared perspective, but they're on the model plane. Okay, so that's, that's a good observation there. Okay, so batch, uh, let's take a look at batch 54. I'm going to look at batch 54. Normally I would look at batch 54 from the con uh, perspective of its contribution part. But because batch 54 is firstly it's on the model plane, and secondly it's almost exclusively in the direction of T1, I'm going to look at identifying the cause of the problem in batch 54 by looking at the loadings P1. Just and the, and the reason why I want to do that is also show you how to interpret the loadings plot for P1. Okay. Now, you're in fact going to do it, <laughs> not me. I'm going to ask you why batch 54 has a large T1 value, okay? And what would be the reason for a large T1 value? How would you, in other words, how does a large T1 value arise from a PCA model of, of this nature when your loadings matrix P1 looks like this? Okay, so I'll give you two, three minutes, and I want you to give me some reasons why you think batch 54 has such a high T1 value. So that's a very long 
T1 value, what might it be due to? Which tags? You have to get a high T1, you have to get a low temperature one. Low temperature R1? Yeah, R2. And is that over the particular time or a certain time within the batch? The all time for R2, there's that little area for R2. Where yeah, but other than this little sliver for R2, which is high, it seems to be for the, for the duration of the entire batch. If you have a low temperature R1 in the X data multiplied by this negative value from P1, you'll get a high T1. Okay. What can we say then about um, flow two? Yeah. Or Harry, flow two? No, no, flow two. Yeah, the last call has a higher high flow two. Right. Over the entire batch? How long is that for? Over this first roughly 60 minutes, so 60 samples. Notice that it's zeros at the end. Okay. So for the for the for the last 40 odd samples, uh, that variable has no contribution. But it's high flow rates for the first 60 odd samples. Okay. Pressure three. Yes, sir. It's very, very uh, straightforward to interpret on these variables that oscillate a lot. It's a little bit messier, but the key point is that you're able to identify not only the tags but also when uh, during the batch, and if uh, those correspond to different phases, it would, it would guide you to tell uh, to tell you during which phase the, the tag caused the problem as well. Yeah. Is it likely that if we looked at, for instance, pressure three, those uh, flip flops would correlate to some feature in the uh, trajectory, like yep. the average trajectory? Um, it could be due to the average trajectory. Um, you, good point. I mean, like, you know, is, is there somewhere it looks like that? Is it because, you know, the pressure has like, generally dips after an increase? Let's take a look here. Uh, what I've got here is I'm showing you the raw data. Unfortunately, I've zoomed it in on certain regions right. of, of each of the tags. But here's the raw data for this batch 54 to confirm our results. So we said high temperature, a low temperature rather, in R1, R2, R3. So here, over the first 50 seconds, yes, there's a low temperature. In fact, it is one of the lowest temperatures. R2 is a special case, I'll come back to that in a minute. And R3, we're seeing very much a low temperature. R2 actually is very high. Yeah, but look, I've, I've zoomed in on the first 20 seconds, which was exactly that earlier blip. Right. 
Okay, so it was that peak that we saw up here for temperature R2 shows that right at the start of the batch, uh, bat batches with high T1 values will have this sort of exhibit where they ramp up differently, they're above the average, and then they go below the average for the remainder of the batch. That almost looks like it's not lined up. Huh? No, it is lined up. Uh, oh, oh, the original data point may not have been lined up. The original, like, the original the batch. Yeah. That's a good question. Um, again, we'll talk about alignment there, but that might be due to that. Good point. Yeah, it, it very much could be due to that. Okay. Yeah, are you sure the plot we have here is one and not the contribution plot because I have I have actually the reverse output in, in the software. I mean my P1 is like yeah. Do you have the reverse in the software but your scores are also reversed in the software? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. okay, so that's why. Yeah. yeah, because if it, if I go back here to the processor software, uh, which is what you're looking at just for right, uh, you'll see that there. so if I go back to my my P1 plot, my P uh, P so that's P2, so here I, my, my score plot is flipped around. Yeah. So if I look at my loading plot in P1, it will be flipped around as well. But numerically, it's the same. Okay, so you could go look at all the uh, all the other trajectories as well. So flow two, we said was high. Flow two in the raw data there, I zoomed in on the first 30 seconds, was above average flow rate over there. And pressure three was was below average. There at the end of the batch. So high at the beginning, but low at the end, and, then, and that's the part I've zoomed in over here. Was that towards the, the last 40 seconds of the batch? Okay. So the raw data always must confirm what you see either in your contribution plot or your loading plot. Again, the, the software for the course, I haven't figured out uh, how to generate these sorts of plots in the, in the, in the, in the process of software. So it may be possible, I'm just not sure. So I've, I've shown you here that. Um, batch 55, we can go look at that one. Um, that's a, kind of up here in T1 and T2. It's got some component in, in some portion in both components. So looking at both loading plots wouldn't be too helpful or, or it's harder. So it's much easier to just con construct a contribution plot from 55 to the output to the cluster over there. And uh, that's not shown over there. So I won't interpret that one, but it's, it's, it's done exactly the same way. Okay, so in fact, all these batches up here with high T1 high, uh, uh, outline over here are all outliers for the same reason. Okay. What happened was that uh, they it was due to the control loops that that manipulate the trajectories for that for that reactor, and that's uh, that's something that Dupont actually was very happy to find out when Paul looked at this data, they subsequently went and fixed this up on, on their nylon reactors, both in Canada and, and in other countries, and that, that problem was fixed up. So this uniform, uh, this problem that reoccurred over and over was just due to a control system problem. Now obviously when I, we go and look at those batches, they're distorting the model for us. They're, they're reorienting the latent variable plane so it makes sense to go exclude those and rebuild the model. And we'd also go and exclude observation 49 as well. So we just go exclude them. So 49 to 55 excluded and we just rebuild the model. Again, I'm just putting two components, not for any particular reason, other than I just want to examine the basic uh, relationships between the variables. Okay, so much, much cleaner. Let's actually, I think there's an interesting feature coming from the third component, if I remember. So I added third component, T2, T3. excluded those observations, rebuild my model, and T3, T2 shows a new cluster for me. Uh, in your notes, I think, is it, is it the same orientation? Yeah. 
So for this, for this particular model, you should have the same score plot in your notes. After excluding batches 49 to 55, which we've identified the, the problem with, we see a new, a new cluster there. And in this particular case, I'm going to do a contribution plot for batch 39. So batch 39 is up here with high T3. And same, same way, this time batch 39 is an outlier due to high temperature C1, the coolant temperature in the first 20, 30 seconds over there, high pressure and high flow rate 2 during that duration. And then also uh, pressure 3 has some negative components and pressure 2 as well towards the end of the batch. So again, very clearly emphasizing where the problem occurs and when. And I've summed up here, sometimes you'll see this in the software package, they'll sum up the contributions. Because I'm looking at the data for all of this tag over time, sometimes it's hard to, to uh, get a sense for which contribution, which tag rather is the most important. So the summation here, this clearly points out, you just look for the numerically large values, 13, 8, 17, and 8 here. They're much larger values than these twos and threes down there. So that guides you as well to figuring out. But your eye does a cumulative sum very well as well. So, um, and I think, yeah, okay, 39 is confirmed here in the raw data in orange. Um, shows, shows exactly those features over there. High temperature C1 at the beginning of the batch. So for those 20, 25 seconds here, we see, in fact, there's about four or five trajectories that have the same offset. The majority of the data, very consistent for that initial temperature rank, very consistent for that initial pressure, but there's five or six batches in there, all corresponds to those outliers uh, or unusual points. All of these here, all of these batches, if you go do a contribution plot, they'll all show similar behavior in their contributions, indicating that it's that problem, that same problem. Time for a break, right?